Okay, are you ready for more half magic? We're going to find out what else happens in chapter five with Martha. Remember, she was half of herself because she wished she wasn't there, but she was only half not there. And she ran into this shop with a rather small gentleman with a small pointed beard. So, um, and then she's talking to him. So she says, oh, do you know mother? Said Martha. Uh, well, not exactly, said the small gentleman. Then how do you know about her? Are you magic too? Are you a wizard or something? I thought you might be when I saw that beard. Do you know any tricks to put me back together again? I'm afraid not, said the small gentleman. Of course, if Mark and Jane and Catherine were here, Martha went on, they've got the charm and they could wish me back. Don't you have any spells to sort of summon people? The small gentleman shook his head. No spells, and I'm not a wizard, I'm sorry to say. This is the first magic thing that ever happened to me, though I had always hoped something would. But maybe we can find them by regular means. What did they do when you ran out of the theater? Did they run after you? Martha looked startled. Why, she said, I never even thought to look back. They probably did, said the small gentleman. They've probably been following you all the time. They're probably outside the shop right now looking for you. I'll go see, said Martha, starting for the door. And it was at that exact moment that Mark in the jewelry store down the street made the wish that was to take him and Jane and Catherine to Martha's side. Immediately, they were there. I did it, said Martha. I found them. No, you didn't. Mark wished on the charm, said Catherine. I don't see why you all keep talking like that, said Jane. There's no such thing as charms. Oh, said the small gentleman. That's not what your sister's been telling me. Who are you? Jane said rudely. Quiet, said Mark. This is no time for mere bickering. We've got to fix up what we did. We've got to stop that awful panic. It's terrible. We were going to be so careful and look what happened. You'd think the charm would have had better sense. There is no charm, said Jane. Stop saying that, said Mark. Listen. The distant sound of fire sirens and police whistles and the cry of people could be heard. Now that you mention it, said the small gentleman, I did think I noticed some slight disturbance earlier. Slight, said Mark, is not the word. Compared with the events of today, the Johnstown flood will go down in, mere, in history as a mere trifle. I know it's my fault for wishing that wish, said Martha, but I think it's everybody else's fault too. Why do they all have to get so excited and start running? One of the least admirable things about people, said the small gentleman, is the way they are afraid of whatever they don't understand. And by now, thousands are probably killed or homeless, went on Mark drearily, and burglars on every hand looting the deserted city, and mother knows we're downtown, he added as a new thought struck him. She'll be worried and out looking for us. Uh, if I may make a suggestion, said the small gentleman, now if ever is time for a really good wish. I'd be ashamed, said Jane, misleading these innocent children, pretending you believe in it. Oh, what's the matter with her? Stop her, somebody, said Catherine. Let me, said Martha. I got us into this. I ought to get us out. She tried to take the handbag from Mark, but of course the handbag just fell through her misty hand onto the floor. So then Mark held the bag and Martha draped herself against it in a clinging, clammy sort of way, like fog against a window pane as Catherine put it afterwards, and wished that Jane might be twice cured of whatever it was that ailed her, and right away Jane remembered about the charm. The next wish was that their mother might find them safe and sound in four minutes' time. That gives me two minutes, said Martha, to put myself back together in. For the third time she draped herself against the bag. I wish, she began, but there was an interruption. Some people had appeared in the doorway of the shop. It was the man in the cap and the woman in the red blouse. Their pockets were bulging, probably with ill-gotten loot, which means stuff that they stole. The man looked round at the walls of bookshelves. This joint ain't no good, May, he said. They ain't got nothing but books. Uh, may I help you? asked the small gentleman, stepping forward. How could you help me if you ain't got none but books, said the man. Then he broke off as he saw the four children. Well, if it ain't the vanishing marvels, he said. Kids, you got some disappearing act. You carried in that bag? What bag? said Mark, putting the handbag behind him. The man had seen Martha now. 
What's the matter with her? He said. She gets stuck half disappeared? Then he smiled grimly. Okay, he said. Tricks like them I can use. Hand over the bag. I won't, Mark started to say bravely, but before he could say it, the man snatched the bag from his hands and turned to run. For the second time that afternoon, Mark made a wish in the very nick, in the words of Catherine. He dove at the man in a flying tackle, and as the two of them went down together, he touched the bag and wished that he might capture the fee single-handed. Of course, one half as good as single-handed is double-handed, so it took him both hands to do it. But 30 seconds later, when the two minutes were up and the children's mother walked into the bookstore, a startling scene met her gaze. A male and a female thief lay bound and gagged on the floor while Mark stood over them victoriously, his hands dripping with diamonds and rubies. Watching him in admiration were Jane and Catherine and Martha, only Martha seemed to be completely transparent. And perhaps oddest of all, there stood the rather small gentleman with the beard who had given her a lift on the night she visited Uncle Edwin and Aunt Grace and had the strange adventure. The combination of all these surprises after the worry she had had during the panic in the streets proved too much for her. She stood swaying in the doorway for a moment, a prey to conflicting emotions. Then she tottered to a chair and collapsed. Like many another in that unfortunate city, during the half hour since Martha made her first wish, she had fainted. The small gentleman bent over and chafed her wrists. She'll be all right, won't she? Martha asked anxiously. I'm sure so. I think so, said the small gentleman. Good. To work then, said Martha. And she draped herself against the bag and wished that she might be twice as much as there as she ever was. Twice as much there as she ever was. That's better, she said a moment later, looking at, down at her old solid self with satisfaction. Then she took the handbag firmly in her own substantial hand and wished that the man in the cap and the woman in the red blouse might become twice as reformed in their characters as any two thieves had ever be, yet become. Mark and Catherine unbound and ungagged the two thieves. Oh, what a wicked one I went and been, said the man in the cap. Now I'm sorry. I've been twice as wicked as you was, said the woman in the red blouse. I'm twice as sorry, too. You ain't, said the man in the cap. You ain't capable. Tiring of this, Martha wished them twice as far as where they belonged, and they went away, probably to join the Salvation Army. The next thing was to wish the stolen jewelry all back where it belonged, too, and this was a simple problem. Then came a harder one. I wish, said Martha, that anybody who's been hurt or upset or anything that's been broken or gone wrong because I wish that wish may be twice as good as it was before. And I wish that everything that has happened because I made that wish should go right out of everybody's mind and be as though it were only a dream, only twice as much so. Except me, please, said the small gentleman. He was standing looking down at their mother in rather an odd way. I should hate not to remember every bit of this afternoon. Except, Martha began. Then she broke off. What's your name? Uh, Smith, said the small gentleman. Except Mr. Smith, said Martha. And us too, of course, she added. They stood listening. In the distance, the sound of fire sirens and police whistles, and the crowd broke off suddenly. There was a silence. Then, faintly, the normal roar of city traffic, usually so ugly, but for this one time so beautiful to hear, fell on their charmed ears. Martha relaxed with a sigh. I was afraid it might wear out before it got through that one, she said. It was a pretty big wish, Mark agreed. It must have been quite a strain on it. Maybe that'll be the last wish we get. Let's wait a while before we find out, said Catherine. Their mother stirred and opened her eyes. She looked around her. Where am I? She said, just like fainted people in books. Then she saw the four children and held out her arms. The three girls ran to her. So, even though he was a boy, did Mark. I had such a terrible dream, their mother said. I dreamed there was an awful panic in the city, and I was out in it looking for you, and then... And then you came into my shop and found them, said Mr. Smith. Their mother looked at him. It really is you, she said. Yes. But I thought, their mother began, I could have sworn... She began again. 
She passed her hand over her forehead and smiled rather palely at Mr. Smith. Every time we meet, I seem to think something strange has just happened. She got to her feet and looked around the room again. There really weren't any thieves or diamond necklaces, were there, she said. What, said Mark? You must have dreamed it, said Martha. I think I'd better go home and lie down, said their mother. I feel very peculiar, <clears throat> said Mr. Smith, clearing his throat nervously. I have a better idea. Couldn't you all come over to dinner with me? Um, or couldn't you all come out to dinner with me? We could go to a movie or something afterwards. Oh, we really couldn't, said their mother. And yet, I think I'd like to, she added suddenly in a rather surprised voice. Only no movies, please, said Martha. Well then, said their mother, their mother rather shyly, perhaps we could all go out to our house after dinner. She looked at Mr. Smith and laughed. We seem to be fated to know each other better, she said. And perhaps they were, because that's what they did. Chapter six, what happened to Jane? I know, it's crazy, right? We'll have to wait and find out tomorrow what happened to Jane. I'll see you later.